Hello, I'm Alina Polyakova, President and CEO of the Center for European Policy Analysis. Welcome to this series on the State of the Alliance, a series of conversations we are having with ambassadors and other European officials about where the alliance stands over a year following Russia's brutal full-scale invasion of Ukraine. And I'm absolutely honored to be able to have this conversation with Ukraine's ambassador to the United States, Her Excellency Oksana Markarova. Madam Ambassador, it's so good to see you, um, even in these dark times. Uh, thank you for taking the time to be with us. So let me just start with a big question. We're a year into this horrific war that Russia has launched unprovoked against Ukraine. The transatlantic alliance is behind Ukraine, supporting Ukraine. But how do you really assess now a year in Western support, both military and financial and humanitarian for Ukraine? Well, um, one year after the full-fledged war, nine years after the start of the war, and um, I, I think we, we can literally say that we really appreciate and value the assistance that we have received. So this year have been unprecedented, especially from the United States, of course, from all of the partners, but especially from the United States. The security assistance, I mean, I know we still don't have enough. I know usually you hear me talking about we need more and faster and what we don't have or what we need urgently. But looking back, we always had the USAI program, uh, which was around 300 million. Mm -hmm. To go from that to um, what we have now, and it's dozens of billions, and the logistical challenge, mm -hmm. which we together overcame, and we were able not only to get it quickly to Poland and to other places, but also get it quickly to Ukraine and to the front line. To have budgetary assistance, again, the highest amount before this year was 3 billion, loan guarantees, which I have structured when we were in the Ministry of Finance. We now received already more than 13 billion grants. And I think the emphasis has to be on that. It's not loans that we will have to return. It's grants. So the U.S. understands that they need to help us, and they need to help us without even thinking about returning it, right? Uh, the humanitarian assistance. And also, which something that we can quantify, but I think it, it worth a lot is the leadership of the U.S. in getting the alliance together, the Rammstein group, the energy contact group, the financial or the reconstruction group now. So uh, again, am I, is this the moment when I can say we are completely happy, we have everything that we need? Unfortunately not, because we will be there when we have everything we need and when we win. But this is the moment when we can you know, pause and say big thank you to the United States first and foremost, but also to all of our friends. So you mentioned winning. And of course, we have heard from many Western officials that our policy should be for Ukraine to win. But given what you just said, that we have a lot more assistance than we did a year ago, um, it has been coming in in waves. We know that Russia is already in the middle of a new offensive. Uh, we're anticipating that Russian forces will double down. We don't see any you know, reasonable, genuine desire from the Russian side to even have conversations about some sort of negotiations, right? Does Ukraine have what it needs to win this year? Well, first of all, not only Russia does not have intent to do something good, they still have the intent to do what they start, what they wanted to do nine years ago and what they wanted to do one year ago. They want to destroy us, completely eliminate us, and subjugate the whole country. So uh, they are not capable of doing that. And that's why from time to time we hear some voices that they would like to talk about something. But that's a mere ask for the operational pause on their side, and we have to understand it very clearly. Do we have enough to win right now? Mm -hmm. Not yet. We need more capabilities in order to be able not only to defend and hold the line, but actually liberate our territory. Yeah. So more artillery, more air defense, more tanks, more air capabilities, more counter battery raiders. I mean, I can go on and on and on. And that list has been put together literally on the 24th of February. And we are discussing it with our partners. Now, 
uh, the majority of the group and last contact Ramstein group gathered together 54 countries mm -hmm. understand what we need and there is a genuine uh, push on on uh, the United States and other countries to find it but this is also a test for all of us as democracies the question is none of us we all are peaceful countries none of us prepared for the war none of us prepared for the world war one type of war so we just have to show that we also can be quick we also can produce more we also can pull our resources together and do this so you mentioned one really important thing that i think is important for us to highlight which is that there are 54 countries in the Rammstein Coordination Group, which provides military assistance and support to Ukraine. Because I think that there's a perception that this is really the US and NATO allies. But of course, 54 countries is much bigger, almost yeah. twice as big, actually, as the NATO alliance. Um, so in terms of the support that you're receiving, not just from the so-called West, meaning Europe and the United States, but other partners, um, do you see that support growing? Do you see a bigger coalition getting behind Ukraine? Is it really becoming a global coalition for Ukraine's fight for freedom? Absolutely, yes. So in all the formats, security, Ramstein group, energy contact group, UN votes, we see the coalition growing. When we started a year ago, it was, you know, the usual suspects. It was the countries that are our strategic allies and partners. Uh, and we knew we could rely on them, US, European Union countries, Japan, you know, others. Now it's 54 countries. Now it's, uh, it's, it's, it's also dozens of countries on the Zooms that we have on a weekly basis on the energy coordination. So more and more countries understand that this is much bigger than Ukraine, that it's not even about, it's not about war in the European continent. It's about the global security architecture, as big as it sounds. So this point goes directly to contradict what has been Russian propaganda and Russian disinformation uh, that we've heard from the Kremlin that somehow Russia is in some sort of war with NATO, which of course is completely ridiculous and false. And I think your point that this is a global coalition that is forming to support Ukraine you know, just sends a very direct message that this is not about a confrontation between NATO and Russia, this is really an unprovoked attack on a country that was peaceful and did not want to be in this war. And in fact, the entire world is uniting to support Ukraine's fight. Let me switch the, the conversation a little bit because, you know, of course, you speak to friends, family in Ukraine quite often. Obviously, you have the contact with uh, the Ukrainian government in Kiev and with the president. I think people often forget uh, what the war looks like on the ground and what's really happening from a humanitarian perspective as well. Can you tell us a little bit more about how the Ukrainian people are dealing with what is a incredibly difficult time? We have battles waging as we speak. Uh, we have Rus Russian forces doubling down across Ukraine's east and the south and the north. What is the spirit and the morale of the Ukrainian people um, a year into this horrible conflict? Well, I think it's, it's, it's worth mentioning two kind of aspects of this. One is it has been very hard. And it's, it's almost impossible to explain how hard it is sitting here in Washington, D.C. You know, it's, it's constant booming and fights, not only on the front lines, but everywhere, literally in Ukraine. It's the destruction of an unbelievable proportion. It's living with the understanding that you might go to sleep and not wake up because you don't know whether the next rocket will, will come. It's many people, literally every family that either lost someone or have someone wounded or have someone on the front line or, you know, even if it's not the, the, the closest family member, but it's about all of us on the liberated territories. And, you know, my, my house was under occupation for 32 days. It's living with the fact, well, first of all, seeing all the destroyed buildings. So even people who were lucky and whose buildings were not destroyed. But you, you, you drive on your street, you walk on your street and you see, you know, the scenes from the World War II movies. And you know who of your neighbors did not survive the occupation. 
uh, not to mention, you know, <clears throat> the people who are still under occupation, people who are missed in action, people who are uh, missed because when Russians occupied a number of areas, we have no idea and, did, and do not hear about some people. So it has been really, really hard. And on top of that, we're just coming out of a very difficult winter without electricity, without hot water, without sewage, without water in general sometimes in some pl places. So it has been very hard. Uh, uh, it has been like Ukraine had experience with hardships before. We went through horrible things from the hands of the same enemy, through Holodomor, through you know World War II, through um, a number of hardships. But this has been such a concentrated uh, hardship and war crimes in just one year, nonstop, that it has been very difficult. And yet, the morale is very high. Mm -hmm. I've been to Ukraine three times since the start of this war, uh, one uh, in April, in September, and uh, the latest one in December. Uh, all of these times have been very difficult, different, uh, difficult in a different way, mm -hmm. but one thing was uh, the same. Everyone I saw, spoke, uh, talked to, from family, from my mom, to, to just the people on the streets, everyone is ready to, 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 to do it until we win. Everyone, regardless of how hard it is, is certain that this time we cannot give up. We, we owe it to people who fight now, we owe it to people who died during this war, and we owe it to generations who fought for this uh, moment. This is the moment when this long history of Russian aggression against Ukraine and Russia's neighbors has to stop. And Ukraine is, of course, fighting this fight, not just for itself, but also for all of Europe and the world, as you said, because if Russia has some sort of win in this war, it'll be a disaster, a complete disaster, not just for Ukraine, for Europe, but for the United States, because without a Europe whole free and a peace with Ukraine at its center, we will not have a whole free and peace transatlantic and alliance. We already know what happens if we do not win. Right. We had it in 2014 and 15. We signed unfair agreements, and even though it was very unfair to Ukraine, we did everything, everything to find diplomatic solution to uh, implement this Minsk Accords and to restore our territorial integrity with the diplomatic means. And Russia used this nine years to get ready for this. Right. So we don't want that pattern to be repeated again. Um, you know, President Biden has recently said that the United States will be with Ukraine for as long as it takes. And I'm struck that sometimes that is a very positive thing, but then the question that comes up, what is it? as long as it takes to do what? And I think the answer to that has to be as long as it takes for Ukraine to win. But of course, then the question comes up, what does winning look like for Ukraine? What does that mean for Ukraine? Because we hear Western officials saying that it'll be up to Ukraine to define what winning looks like. So what, what does it look like? I think the people of Ukraine already defined what victory would should look like and what we see as the victory. And President Zelensky took that definition from the people of Ukraine and put it in the 10-step peace formula. So it, it's very simple, actually. For us to win is to liberate our territory within internationally recognized borders. Mm -hmm. And Crimea is no different than Donetsk and Lugansk or Kherson or anything else. Is to return all our people back including the children that Russia has stolen, is for justice to be served. So everything from the criminal procedures in Ukraine to all the three international courts to the special tribunal, which we will work hard mm -hmm. to, to have in order to prosecute Putin for the crime of aggression and all the people around him, and to also rebuild in Ukraine so that we can get not only to, for, for not only get peace, not only get just peace, but also lasting peace. So that's why I really like the phrase that President Biden is using, that U.S. will be with us as long as it yeah. takes, because it's not only until we win, mm -hmm. it's also after we win. Mm -hmm. As long as it takes for Ukraine to win this war and then win the peace and be a very important element 
that will be able to not only restore the international global security system, but be an answer to so many global challenges. We can feed the world. We can be an answer to the energy risks that are created by Russia and so many more. Well, Madam Ambassador, I think we could go on for a very long time, but um, thank you so much for your time. Thank you for everything you're doing to make sure that the U.S. is here for as long as it takes. And I, I think we obviously will be based on what President Biden has said and based on the kind of congressional bipartisan support that Ukraine has had and support across the entire alliance and the entire world. Um, thank you for all the Ukrainian freedom fighters who sacrificed their lives and continue to sacrifice their lives for Ukraine's freedom, for all our freedom. Slava Ukraini. Heroem Slava.